So when I started drinking, I thought, ah, oh, this feels good. Uh, now I can drink, I feel like I can breathe. Um, when I drink, I can walk out and about. Mm. Um, because I'd have such bad panic attacks that sometimes I'd be walking in the streets of Nairobi and I collapse. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to I've been meaning to ask. This is an interactive segment. I love to have people on this bench who are able to share their life stories. I believe that everyone does have a story and someone's life, based on your story, may be transformed forever. Today is no exception. I have a great guest on the bench. Her name is Shiro Ogola and she has an amazing story of one who is able to fight the fight, the good fight, and come to the other side and she wants to share herself for, for the first time. We've not sat down, we've not, this is not scripted, but I've heard a little bit about her story and today she's here to share with us and to share with you what it is that she's been through. Shiro Karibu Sana. Thank you so much. Looking lovely. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, welcome, welcome on the bench. Shiro, tell me, I've called you Shiro Ogola, but I know you have other names. What are the <laughs> other names? Alice Chantiel Wanjiro Ogola but I just go by my alias name, Shiro Gola. That's Shiro with a Y, by the way. Shiro with a Y. S-H-Y-R-O. Like okay. Yes. Wow. So Alice, Chantiel, Shiro, Ogola. Ogola. Tell us about Alice and Chantiel. I know you don't use those two names no. for a reason. Yes. Go ahead and tell us. I mean, um, my mom, when my mom named me, she didn't really name me after anybody in particular. Mm -hmm. These were just names she picked up. And so I think growing up and realizing there's so much power in naming children, yeah. I figured that, you know, I might as well just go by my African names, mm -hmm. Shiro and Ogola, which is my surname. Yeah. And a lot of people hear Shiro and Ogola, and I mean these... That was my next question. Yeah, how, <laughs> how do those two come together? So Ogola mm -hmm. is my surname, that's my father, mm -hmm. my adopted father that okay. is. Okay. Um, Shiro, that's from my mom, which is Kikuyu. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it really startles people yeah. when they hear that. And yeah. I figured it might be a good way to brand myself. Absolutely. Yes. Shiro is, you're named after your mom's mom? Something like that. Something like that. Yes. Okay. So tell me about Alice and Chantiel. Chantiel means? Chantiel means witch. Wow. Yes. In what? In Cuban. In, wow. In yeah. Cuban. Yes. All right. So and I, that was just something I came across. Mm -hmm. um, one day we were doing uh, name reviews in school mm -hmm. and just getting to know what uh, different names mean. And yeah. so when I got to hear about that, it mm -hmm. kind of, you know, threw me off. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I rebranded myself, I figured out that's not what I want to be associated Did with. Did mom know what Chantiel means no. or she liked the name? She just liked the name. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, yeah. I get it. Tell me, uh, you have such an amazing story. Uh, where does it all begin? Wow, um, thank you. <laughs> it's, um, it is a crazy story, and this goes back to the mid-90s. Okay. Um, I was born uh, to a young woman, a lovely young woman called Purity. Mm -hmm. My mother was 14 okay. at the time. Okay. That's just a child having yes. a child. Yes. And so when she had me, Something crazy that she always tells me is that she did not know she was pregnant with me mm -hmm. for the longest time. Mm -hmm. And being an orphan herself and not coming from any stable background. So mom was an orphan? Yes. Okay. Um, not having any stability and getting pregnant. She really just didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, she had run away from her auntie's place who mistreated her and treated her very poorly. Mm -hmm. And so she was a squatter at yeah. a friend's place at the time. Yeah. And so I tend to say that I'm a miracle that's yes. walking because she didn't even give birth to me in hospital. Wow. Yes, she had me in the house. Wow. And so she delivered me that old school way yeah. and I came into this world yeah. and um, I mean my story just started unraveling um, 
My what, what year was that? When were you born? This was 1995 okay. in May. Mm -hmm. Yes, and mm -hmm. I guess that's why I'm such a summer girl. <laughs> okay, you love you love summer. Yes, yeah. The, yeah. the the winter cold uh, <clears throat> season is just not for me. Okay, but um, once my mom had me, um, it was a very difficult time for her, not mm -hmm. having any support, yeah. living with friends. Yeah. And so um, I didn't really quite grow up with her. Mm -hmm. um, I found myself being given to different people from time to time to help raise me mm -hmm. as she tried to you know, figure herself out as a young mother. And she got involved with uh, this young man at mm -hmm. the time um, who initially I thought was my father. Okay. And this was when I was just months old, so the first maybe one, two years of my life, I thought this man was my dad. Okay. And so uh, they ended up having a child together. Mm -hmm. That is my brother, okay. our second born. That's the one who follows me. Yeah. And once they had the child, the marriage as it was seemed to be very difficult. Mm -hmm. I don't have many memories um, of that particular season, mm -hmm. but one time my therapist was asking me, what is the earliest memory yeah. you have? Yeah. And I thought about it and what shocked me was, I can remember being in, inside my crib mm -hmm. and seeing this man sitting on a knife wow. and arguing with my mom. And How as old were you then? You I must have been about two or wow. two and a half, wow. something okay. of the sort. Okay. And I remember my mother telling me that one of the reasons they separated was because he was a very violent man. Mm -hmm. And so once they broke up and parted ways, um, my mom and I, uh, you know, went separately, we were living together, but mm -hmm. she ended up leaving my brother with the father. Okay. Turns out he's the father, but not my father. Okay. And so uh, we were living alone. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a pretty hard time because we were living in the slum at the time. Okay. And so because my mom needed to make sure that I'm safe, that I'm well taken care of, and she had a job, mm -hmm. had to like make it to town by probably six in the morning, mm -hmm. and I need to go to school, I need to be safe, yeah. she made a decision to take me to live with her auntie. Okay who's my grandmother, yes, yes. and that was in Meru. Okay. And that was a very, very crazy season because this woman uh, was the one she lived with before she ran away. Wow. And the reason she ran away was because of how badly she would treat my mother. Wow, so, so mom was desperate. Yes. And that's why she sent you over to, yes. to live with her auntie, to live with your her grandmother. Auntie. Wow. Yes. How old were you at this time? Um, I should have been about five. Okay. Yes, like because that was my first year in school, in class one, that is. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay, so you go over to live with grandma mm -hmm. uh, at five years old. Mm -hmm. What happens? Um, you know, you're just a child. You don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. I just remember crying out for my mom when she left. Um, because, you know, you're used to just having your mother around. It's not easy when you're in a different environment and nobody seems familiar. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's very sad when I think about it, but it was a very cruel time mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And I'll be very open with you. This woman was just... Uh, man, she was, she was terrible. Yeah. She was terrible. Yeah. Um, my mother worked so hard, believing that she would give all that she had to this person so that she would take care of me, yes. for me to have the best, yeah. but that was not what was happening. Mm -hmm. I literally lived over there like I was a street, a street child. Wow. I would walk to school barefoot, I had tattered clothes, mm -hmm. but when my mom would come to see me, mysteriously, you know, nice clothes appear, and you know, because I would see that my mom just comes for a short period of time, then has to leave. Yeah. I'm scared to talk about what's really happening yes, from because uh, you're going to be left there. behind. Yes, yeah. because yeah. I'm going to be left behind and experience, you know, more brutality. Mm. Um, she was physically abusive. Now, mm. as an adult, I realize she was also emotionally and uh, mentally abusive. Mm. Um, I remember I lost my front left 
tooth because she tied me to a tree and gave me a whooping that I have never forgotten wow. that have left me with scars on my body till today mm -hmm. simply because I had been denied food for a few days as a way to punish me and I snuck in the kitchen one night to steal food and I got caught and wow it was it was a lot it yeah. was a lot yeah and so I was constantly just crying out to God. And I feel like that's probably where I see my relationship with God coming, you know, starting from when I look back. Mm -hmm. I would sit outside, look at the stars, and I, I would tend to believe that there was something out there, something higher than me, something mm. bigger than me. In mm. school, in Sunday school, we're taught about Jesus Christ having died for mm. our sins. But at the same time, I felt very strongly that there has to be something bigger mm. out there that would get me out of that situation. At that tender age, you knew this is not what life should be. Yes. Yeah. You, um, you know, sometimes people get into abusive relationships and they don't even know they're going through abuse. Were you clear that there was something wrong? I definitely knew that mm. something was wrong. And this is because before my mother gave me <clears throat> to this woman that I would live with her, mm. I'd also lived with a few people, like okay. neighbors here and there. Maybe yeah. she'd take me to a friend yeah. for a few weeks, come back home or something. And I saw the way parents related with their kids. Mm. I would go out with this woman's kids or just go out with friends from school. And I would see the way their parents treat them. Mm. And I knew something was definitely very wrong okay. when it came to the environment I lived with. Yes. Because people treated me yes. much better out there yes. with more yes. compassion and grace. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, so you are going through this. Um, you're in school at this time. Yes. Um, what's, what was your feeling towards mom when you were living now with grandma? What, what was the thinking there? Were you feeling like you've been abandoned? Did you feel like... Did you understand that she needed to work and that's why you were over with grandma? To be honest, not at all. I didn't understand that. I don't think I had the capacity yeah, to yeah, get that yeah. because I knew other mothers would work but mm. still lived with their children. I felt that she abandoned me. I mm. just felt that she abandoned me because every time she'd come to visit and she's coming with all these goodies and gifts and all that, um, she looked very put together and you can imagine she's just 20, you know, in her early 20s at the time. She's glowing, she looks beautiful, she's, you know, dressed up in good clothes mm -hmm. and she seems to be fine because that's how she presented herself. Yeah. And so for me, I would look and I'm like, if you're leaving okay and you seem to be fine, why are you leaving me here to wow. suffer? Wow. And so I felt abandoned. Mm -hmm. I felt abandoned and... One thing about my mom that always was from the moment I was born, at least the memory I have of her, yeah, yeah. is that she was always a very angry person. Angry? Yes. Wow. And so I don't think we ever had the best communication mm -hmm. between us. Mm -hmm. And so I never felt that she was vulnerable enough to make me understand what was happening. Mm -hmm. And so even when I'd try, you know, to cry and like, beg her to just stay i just felt that she didn't care and maybe that's why she wow. left or maybe i was a burden wow yes did you ever feel loved by my mother no not wow. at all wow okay so fast forward you go through school how long did you live there <coughs> yes, yeah, so this was now when I was in class two. Mm -hmm. uh, I just joined class two. I lived with this woman um, till I was in class five. So that's about three, four years. And um, I mean, one day, very, very miraculously, I hadn't been told my mom was coming to visit or anything. She just showed up. And she showed up with this strange man. Mm. And this whole period of time when I, when I lived with this woman, remember that I have a brother that I do remember mm. is somewhere, but mm. I haven't seen him all this time. So I'm constantly wondering how my brother is because I know he's definitely not with my mother. Mm -hmm. And I think kids are very smart because yeah. when I think about it back then, I used to have questions, but mm -hmm. you're afraid to ask because you 
you'll assume that you'll just be beaten or mm. punished. It's mm. grown-up talk. Yes, yes. So my mom showed up with this strange man and I remember, you know, just looking at him and wondering, okay, who's this? I haven't seen this person before. Yeah. He was very kind. He came with so much, uh, so many gifts, so much stuff. But on this particular day, I had written a letter for my mom and I'd written it way, way before and kept it and, uh, and just told myself when she comes, I'm going to give this mm. to her mm. because things have gotten really, really bad. Mm. Um, and I think I need her to understand that I really need to get out of here. And something I don't think she knows until today was I had a plan. My plan was to give her that letter the next time I see her, and if she doesn't respond and get me out of there, mm. I was going to run away. Mm. And one of the main reasons to me coming uh, and making that decision was because, again, I think this is the first time she'll hear of it, but when I had just turned nine, that was the first time I was sexually abused mm. by this woman's uh, nephew. Mm. And it was crazy because now thinking about it, um, he was the most comfortable person for me there because he treated me much better than everybody else. Mm. And so he provided an environment for me to feel like, you know, Uncle Nani mm. is the one that loves you even if other mm. people treat you yeah. very, yeah. very poorly. Mm. And he had kind of floated that idea. Mm. And, and in, my, in my mind, and was like, you know, I could always take you somewhere else to live somewhere because I can see how your shushu treats you. Wow. Yes, and that was my plan. And but that's your uncle, so he's taking advantage yes. of the fact that he knows that you are not, um, you're not living well. Yes, absolutely. Mm. And so when my mom came uh, with this man, um, I gave her the letter, and I think that was the first time I saw my mom crying. So she read the letter yes. in your presence? Yes. What were the contents of the letter? I can't remember everything I wrote, but one thing that stood out was me saying that I was so broken, like a puppy that's been rained on. I mean, I was very poetic. I'm a wow. creative generally. So and how old were you at this time? I was nine. You were nine? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So she broke down, and I think it's because she, she knew how this woman uh, is or was. Because she because lived with her. She lived with her. Yeah. And so she definitely knew it wasn't far-fetched that everything I tried to describe, how she would tie me to a tree and beat me up, lock me somewhere, probably not give me food for days. My mom bringing me clothes and shoes and she takes them away and gives to her kids. And it was a very basic Cinderella story mm -hmm. where some days you're not even going to school because you're just a small house help right there. And apparently she'd made the decision to now take me Turns out that she had met this man um, and they were now dating and she mentioned that she had a daughter who was living somewhere and the daughter wasn't fine and this man was very open to meeting me mm. and figuring out how we could change that situation. Mm. And to date, that person became my adopted dad and that's the man that adopted me, gave me his son in Mogola mm. and raised me. And so I was so excited. I remember wow. the moment my mom told me, by the way, we're leaving. This is your last day here. I didn't even want to pack anything. There was, was like, nothing to pack. You were was, like, I just want to go, you know? <clears throat> anything that, that's here, you can keep it. Wow. Yes. At nine years old. Yes. My goodness. OK, so from nine, you moved to Nairobi? Yes. OK, how did so that go? I moved back to Nairobi. I was born in Ngong. Ngong is my hometown, 111. And so we come back and now I start living with my mother. And so I'm excited because now I have my mom around. I don't have to see these people again. Mm -hmm. And now I have a dad as well, which was new. I remember I used to call him Uncle Mike. <laughs> Initially I had to, you know, mm -hmm. just warm up to the idea of accepting yeah. him as my yeah. dad. He was an amazing father. He mm. was very kind, very gentle, um, a really, really good communicator. And okay. I think that is where me and him gelled because my mom and I had a complete disconnect. Okay. And so it was easier for me to, you know, just communicate with him <coughs> and, and I was closer to him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's definitely way, way older than my mother. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
he had a family. He was already married, okay. had a wife and children, uh, didn't have a girl, all boys, and so now I was the only girl wow. that he had. Okay. And so I was like the special flower yeah. in his life. Yeah. Um, and again, just like I mentioned that kids are very smart, I remember this man, so we were living separately and he'd come for dinner, come visit, sometimes sleep over and all that. But sometimes he'd be leaving and telling me that, you know, Toto, I'm going to work. And I'm like, what work is this? Does this man go to do at 11 p.m.? Like, mm. what job is this? I think, <laughs> as as far as I know, people yeah. you know go to work in the morning, <clears throat> come back in the <throat> evening, and I suspected that he did because he took a, uh, some time. It took a while before he told me he had a family, mm. but eventually he warmed up to you know just being open and honest and told me, you know what, I have another family. You have brothers. Um, mm. You'll get to meet them someday. Mm -hmm. And that was exciting because, I mean, I was alone yeah, in the situation yeah. of living with yeah. my mother. Yeah. I didn't have any sibling to play with, maybe mm. just friends from school. Mm. So that, that was good. He provided for us. He mm. took me to school. He treated me so well that I never felt that I wasn't his blood. Yeah. And I was very proud, you yeah. know, to be his child and to have him as my dad. Yeah. But on the other side, my relationship with my mom was just going completely Well, let's down. talk about that. Why? Because it feels like she came and rescued you from a situation. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that your relationship began to take a tank? So the thing is, my mom was a heavy drinker. Mm -hmm. And when she met this man, uh, from what she explained to me, now in recent days, he introduced her to alcohol mm -hmm. because I never remembered my mom as a drinking person. Okay. She was a very serious church goer and mm -hmm. very put together in so many aspects. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this season of life, that particular season, she was drinking heavily, yes. partying a lot. Yeah. And like I mentioned, I've always remembered her to be a very angry person. And mm -hmm. I think it's because of everything she had gone through yes. in yes. her life. Yes. and not having the right mentors mm. and guidance, mm. you know, and trying to heal and maybe not knowing how to. Yeah. And so um, I'd find myself in situations where, first of all, my mom seemed to be very ashamed of me mm. in, in terms of she would introduce me to people as her sister. Yeah, because, I mean, I've seen both of you together and, and you guys look so... <laughs> I mean, you'd pass for being sisters, there's yes. no doubt about it, and it's because she was young when she yes. had you, right? Yes. Okay, so she and was so, ashamed of it. Yes, and I mean, <clears throat> being in her 20s at the time, don't forget, I'm very tall for yes. a lady, mm -hmm. and I was very chubby, and I think she maybe felt some type of way having to explain to people, like, how do I have a child mm -hmm. this big at my mm -hmm. age, and this old, and so that rubbed me the wrong way, mm -hmm. because I felt rejected. And we'd have um, very, very bad fights when she, she'd get drunk because she'd get very emotional mm. and talk about how I was a mistake. Mm. She felt that I ruined her life. Mm. She felt that had I not come into this world, her life would have been on a very different trajectory wow. and a much better one. Wow. And Generally, that just made me feel unwanted. Absolutely. It would make anybody feel unwanted. Yes. I mean, you had no part to play in all this. You find yourself in this situation, and the only person you'd rely on yeah. is, is putting you in a, in a very interesting... So, what happens then with the relationship? So, here is uh, Mr. Ogola. He's accepted you. He's treating you really well. And here is mom, and things are just sticking. I mean... Naturally, I felt that my dad was the one who understood me. He was on my side. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that my, my, mom's, um, my mom's way of dealing with things was very physical mm -hmm. and brutal. So mm -hmm. um, in hindsight, I actually feel like she didn't even realize that sometimes she would be projecting her own issues on me. Okay. Like sometimes the <coughs> problem is not what I've done. Let's yeah. say for example, I've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's not really about what I've done. It's that she's found a reason to now just vent yeah. using that situation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I- Was she ever violent? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. I coolered 
weeps from my mom like mm. nothing I'm telling you mm. and my dad had never whooped me before so I found that because kids are very different I believe in mm. regards to how you deal with them mm. I, I've only I'm a sanguine melancholic and I'm, mm. I'm very 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 emotional mm. I'd find that when my dad would try to explain to me about life and maybe making a mistake trying yeah. to grow from something yeah. I would easily adapt to things when he'd um, explain them to me, I'd understand better. Yeah. And the whole, you know, shouting and physical brutality was just not the way for me. Yeah. It yeah. made me cave, cave yeah. in a lot and, and just block her out completely. Mm. Mm. And so we were just, you know, we seemed to be two worlds apart. We live in the same house, yeah. but sometimes we don't even talk. Wow. But more so was that because she was partying a lot, she would disappear sometimes for days I don't see her mm. and just comes back changes you know and disappears again sometimes if she's home um, I would note that she had crates of beer in the bedroom mm. she would just be drinking and drinking and just sleeping so mm. I never get to really talk to her mm. um, see her a lot she never really was that present when it came to school matters. Yeah. Um, if I had an award I'm picking, especially in the music or drama department yeah. or any academic um, type of situation. Mm. Um, and so I just felt like she wasn't there yeah. completely. Yeah. And I didn't know how to relate with her because I'm scared. I, I, I feel like my relationship with her was, I feared her. Yeah. I f it was very militant. Yeah. Yes. Wow. You go through life, you go through school, and then what happens now? At what point do you, um, how does your relationship with mom begin? Did, I know it's done for the worse. How did we get there? And at it, what age was that? Uh, it definitely did. So what happened was when I was 11, this was in class seven. Uh, my mom had my brother. Mm -hmm. Now that's our third born. Mm -hmm. And this is now a son from Mr. Ogola. Mm -hmm. And so I think I messed up a bit because one day I wrote a letter. I was in boarding school. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a letter to my parents, two separate letters. I wrote one uh, for my dad and you know, I was praising him and just thanking him for everything he'd done yeah. for me and telling him how amazing he was and that I loved him. Mm. And the other letter to my mom was me just telling how much I hated her. Wow. And I, I just really vented out my feelings because, I mean, you know, I'm 11, I'm almost becoming a teenager, I'm having my own ideas of how, you know, life should be and how a parent should be treating me. Mm -hmm. And so um, every time I'd talk to my dad about it, he, he would insist that, why don't you try talking to her and letting her know how you feel? Mm. But nobody seemed to understand that I'm trying, but there's no opening space yeah. for that yeah. to happen. Yeah. So when my brother came into the picture, um, I felt that she just didn't seem to have any need for me anymore mm -hmm. but at the same time she wasn't even present for him yeah and so yeah. i would find myself taking a lot of responsibilities for mm -hmm. this child mm -hmm. because it felt like her drinking was what was more important yeah uh, she was very depressed she was just in her own whirlwind and going through her own motions mm -hmm. i didn't understand that at the time mm -hmm. and so um things got really worse because my father got to a place where he didn't feel he could trust her with finances mm -hmm. because maybe he's gonna send money and maybe she'll disappear partying and drinking or use mm -hmm. it for other things mm -hmm. and not really cater for and he knew that that was her last time Yes, okay. he absolutely did. Okay. And I mean, they would drink together, mm -hmm. but now at this point when my brother was born, mm -hmm. their relationship was turning to just be worse, worse by the day. They were mm -hmm. constantly fighting. Mm -hmm. He wanted her to settle down and mm -hmm. pretty much become more like his first wife, mm -hmm. but she's just a young girl trying to you know, figure out her life and all mm -hmm. that. So I don't think she, her mentality was anywhere close to settling down. Yeah at all and so they would fight and the the relationship became very violent physically as well i remember seeing them just being very brutal you know bottles broken everywhere blood all over mm. and i was so traumatized by yeah. it yeah 
Um, and so it became so bad that at some point um, they just wouldn't talk at all. My father would only come and visit when she's not around mm -hmm. or ask for us to go and meet him outside. Mm -hmm. That went on for a while. I joined high school and the relationship now just seemed to be me being pulled by each of them, everybody trying to get me on their side. Okay. So everyone is trying to bash the other one. Okay. So when it comes to my dad, my dad is constantly reminding me that your mother just drinks a lot, she's just an alcoholic, she doesn't do A, B, and C, blah, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. My mom, on the other hand, is like, this man, this man, this, this and this, this and that. And sometimes throw out the whole, and he's not even your father anyway. Yeah, which messes with your mind yes, and your heart. Yes, because yeah. I'm like, but you introduced me to him. Mm -hmm. We changed my papers legally. We mm -hmm. made him my father. But now the thing is, he of course ended up winning when it came to me because he knew how to get through to me. Yeah. My mom had never taken time to know me. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel now as an adult, she never really knew me. Mm -hmm. My dad knew the buttons to push. She knew where exactly to touch. Mm -hmm. He always knew what are the things to say. Yeah. And he definitely knew that by supporting me in the little things that I loved doing, mm -hmm. um, of course, I'm just a child. And to some degree, it can be quite manipulative yeah. because you know what to do so that yeah, yeah. this child can be Absolutely. on your side. And so I ended up siding with him a lot. Um, we would go out for, he'd take me out for dinner dates after school and stuff mm. like that. And mm. that would just, you know, bring out the demons in my mother. And mm. she just didn't understand why. Why are you getting so close to this man and you and I don't have this Shiro, fast forward, you get to the place where you begin, you look at your life and it's almost like your mother reincarnate. Yes. What happened to you? How did you get there? Yes, yeah, so um, in my third year of high school, I was 15, my mother was served with court documents and my dad had taken her forward, you know, claiming that she wasn't of sound mind to take care of my brother and I. And so, you know, she left, um, was no longer a part of our lives. My brother and I were left on our own. Um, so basically, we just lived together, my brother, myself, and uh, house help. My dad would be there footing bills, taking care of us, school and everything. But we were pretty much on our own. I became very re resentful towards my mom. I was angry. I hated her. Um, I felt that surely what kind of a mother just leaves her kids like that and just abandons her children. My brother was just four and doesn't even get to know you. I felt like it was another repetitive cycle. I mean, you left the brother who follows me. You left me at some point, now you're leaving this child. And so my mindset was pretty much fixed on, I wanna work so hard to become, I just wanted to be a billionaire. I wanted to be wealthy and just never ever have to feel like I have to depend on anybody ever again, mm. that I can take care of myself and my brother. And my mindset was like that because coming from a place of so much luck and not just financially, but I think mentally, emotionally, I thought that you know building wealth and, and, and being financially stable would be the only way to would fill my life. Mm -hmm. And so I started working at that age. I would be leaving school, going to studios, finding odd jobs to just do here and there. Mm -hmm. um, until I cleared high school, my dad insisted that I needed to move in with his family, mm -hmm. which from the get-go I knew was a terrible idea. Yeah. First, because his wife never really was for the idea. Yeah. And I'd seen all these movies with stepmothers and I was like, oh Lord, this might become yeah. another yeah. repetition of mm. what happened to me as a child. Mm. She was ready to take in my brother, but not me. But my dad insisted and so I, I didn't really have an option. Um, fast forward, when we moved in there, um, everything was cordial. Let me just say cordial. We tried to be respectful. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I definitely knew these people didn't really like me. Were the other kids older or younger than you? Um, two of them are older than me. Okay. So if I was to put myself in that lineup, I would be third. Okay. Then the rest are younger than me. Okay. And so I constantly felt like I didn't belong, which yes. was what had happened my whole life, you okay. know? 
Okay. And so um, <clears throat> it was a very difficult time because my dad wasn't living there with us. Okay. Um, he wasn't really living in that home either. And so I felt that anything that happened that felt a bit unfair, he wasn't there to see for himself yeah. or solve it. Yeah. And if I was to complain about anything, yeah. it would be made to seem like I'm being ungrateful. Yes, yes. And because I've lived with strangers and I've lived with uh, people in other homes before, I know that feeling of just being made feel lesser than. Mm. Like you're just in a home, you're just a squatter. So humble yourself. Well, if you like something or you don't like it, that's not up to you. Mm. And so that was my life for about a year until uh, my stepmother and I had a very, very bad fight. Um, what was the fallout? What was the, what was the problem? So um, it was on a Sunday morning, and <clears throat> this is now in 2013. And I was busy in the kitchen prepping the kids for church and all that. And she came into the kitchen and started yelling about something. And as she was complaining and complaining, she, she, she mentioned something that had to do with me being brought into that house and it rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. And I think on that particular day, I, I was just fed up. You know, like I, I was just tired, I'm exhausted mentally, mm -hmm. emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I should mention is that I'd already finished high school and having told my dad that music was what I wanted to pursue, he didn't seem to care about what yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm doing next. Yeah. And I just wanted to get out of there, figure out my life and, and have a better life for myself and my brother. And so we, we you know, just ended up arguing it out. And she, she just seemed to like blow up. And it was so crazy because I'd never seen her like that. I was so scared, but at the same time in so much shock. And at the back of my mind, just thinking, what is this? You know, I, I don't think I need any of this. And so how I moved out was I ran through the back door of the kitchen, went out the gate, and I left. And that is how I moved out of my you father's house. You left and never looked back. I never looked back. Shiro, you got into alcoholism yourself. Yes. How did you end up there? So having um, left my father's house, being out here, uh, starting a life on my own, um, I felt lonely. I was definitely sad. I felt empty. I felt like I didn't have anybody, just like other people, you know, out here seem to have families and, and people who provide a solid foundation for them. Um, my mom was somewhere there, out there, I don't know. My dad and I, you know, having moved out of his home in that kind of way, our relationship had been, you know, Strength. you know, yeah. uh, it just broke. And I, tr I started, you know, just making music, working, trying to fend for myself. And unfortunately for me, shortly after, this is now in 2016, um, I had a, an incident where I got kidnapped. In 2016? Yes. Okay. October, I got kidnapped and assaulted by a guy that I knew who was my rider. And so on this particular day, I, I really thought this man was going to kill me. And having gotten out of this particular situation, uh, because I just remember telling God, you know, help me get out of this and I'm going to really, really change my life if there's something wrong that I'm doing. Um, the PTSD was too much, the trauma was too much, and I feel like it was a build-up of all the things I had been going mm. through since childhood. And then this traumatic thing has happened. Um, I now have a court case. I don't have anybody supporting me. I have to keep seeing this man in court. No justice is being served. And of course, for my family, um, um, among other people, a lot of people blamed me for what happened to me. And it was too much to deal with, and so I started drinking to cope. Mm. And not realizing at that time that, you know, with alcoholism and addiction being a, a brain um, chronic disease, a chronic brain relapsing disease, um, I had the genetic predisposition from my mom. Oh, wow. From my mom's side of the wow. family. Wow. And so when I started drinking, I thought, ah, oh, this feels good. Uh, now I can drink, I feel like I can breathe. Um, when I drink, I can walk out and about mm. um, because I'd have such bad panic attacks that sometimes I'd be walking in the streets of Nairobi and I collapse. 
mm. and I wake up in somebody's shop and mm. someone is telling me, hey, madam, you were walking and just, you Collapsed. know, fainted. People brought you wow. here. And it's because I, this man was still stalking me. I had to keep moving houses about three times a year. Mm. Um, I was having so much anxiety. And so the drinking just started out as a way to cope. But eventually it kept building mm. into serious addiction. Mm. Um, and I didn't realize that at first. Being out here and especially in the music industry, um, there's a lot of glamorizing when it comes to drugs yeah, and yeah, alcohol. Yeah. You find that a lot of um, a lot of alcohol or alcoholic companies um, or brands, uh, you know, are out there behind different events. You know, um, sponsoring so many artists, so many things mm -hmm. happening out here. And so it felt normal. Mm -hmm. And so I, I used to think that if I go out and after an event I'm drinking and partying with people, then that's okay since everybody yeah. is doing it. Yeah. But the difference was while we can drink over the weekend because we've had you know events and we're having fun, you can wake up on Monday morning and get to work. Mm -hmm. But I can't because I wake up sick. So I need to drink some more for to my body to actually function. Wow. Yes. So it was more of pain and disease that is causing you to be in this, um, for lack of a better word, this drunken state yes. in order to feel better. Is that yes. what it was? Yes. Mm. Yes. To just accept, to yeah. be able to to accept the reality. Yeah. But I think it was more of escaping it, yes, though. Yes, absolutely. Um, escaping the reality that I'm alone. I'm yeah. out here. Yeah. My relationship with my dad dead. Yeah. My mom, I haven't seen for years. Yeah. Um, I'm unwanted. I don't even know who my biological father is. Wow. I'm not at a place where if I got sick, because sometimes I drink in the house and I'm crying thinking, if I died today, who's going to bury me? Wow. If that man had killed me on that day, who's going to find me? Who cares? Wow. Wow. And so it was just a combination of everything. And generally, scientifically, it being a disease yeah. because you're unable to cut yourself. Yeah. Uh, there are different types of drinkers, and I, I'm a gamma, uh, I, I'm a gamma alcoholic, recovering alcoholic, um, and so I couldn't be able to function at all. I'd be having crazy withdrawals, the shakes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, feeling just sick and weak, mm -hmm. and you know, you pump yourself with more booze to mm -hmm. be able to seem like you're bright and you know, wow. all smiling. What else were you abusing? Um, so I alcohol was my DOC. That's my primary drug of choice. Um, I've never really been a smoker, mm. so that wasn't, you know, part of it. But at a few events, I, you know, tried cocaine, mm. which was something my friends did uh, from time to time. However, it just never had the same um, effect on me, mm. and I really thank God. So um, alcohol was just the, the thing that I stuck to mainly. That was the thing that just had held me. At what right. point did you know this is not the way life should continue? At, at what point did you know um, this is now an addiction and I need to do something about this? Um, so I feel like uh, in 2019, I had, a, I had an idea that this was already a problem. My drinking was a problem. And I remember floating it uh, by my friend. We're just casually talking and I told her, you know, I really think I have a drinking problem. The way I drink just doesn't seem to be normal. Mm -hmm. And I broke down and I told her, I also feel like my life is becoming, you know, a replica of what I was running away from when mm -hmm. it came to my mom. Because mm -hmm. I saw so many similarities, things that I would be doing in my own hidden space yeah. that yeah. I, I watched happen with her. Mm -hmm. And she just told me, you know, I don't really think so. I just think you're stressed and, you know, that, that's just it. And so I brushed it off, but I tried to like get sober and in my own strength, <laughs> clearly that wasn't yeah, going to be yeah, possible. Yeah. And you know, when you, when you, when you're going down that hole, if you don't have anybody out there just trying to even remind you of who you are or mm. who you're meant to be, you just, um, you just keep sinking lower and lower. And by that, I mean, I would mess up let's say this caliber of friends, 
mess up everything with them. And so because now I don't have the right people um, around me, I would sink much lower looking for other people. But because misery loves company, yeah. you look for people who you feel you're slightly better than, but of course you're definitely deteriorating. Mm. And that just kept happening. I messed up a lot at work. In fact, um, I was employed by Dr. Pete Odera at okay. some point. Yeah. I worked for him, mm. great man. Mm. And um, he didn't really have an idea that initially that I had a drinking problem mm -hmm. until one day I showed up to work drunk and I drank so much at work because I'd be hiding my alcohol in coffee mugs and water bottles and I ended up collapsing at work. Then he took me to hospital and that was the first time I had that conversation with him. Mm -hmm. And now it hit me that whoa this is this, this is, is serious, serious. Yeah. this is serious yeah. it's been too long that i hide it and it's been working mm -hmm. but now that people can notice and yeah. i'm even going into spaces i shouldn't be stepping into in this kind of state yeah. um it's bad but at the same time the fact that i have that conversation with him but still go home and drink some more after hospital because not because i want to i'm drinking because i need to my body really needs this because mm. i literally i'm sick yeah and i'd be drinking and crying and just fighting god and i'm like wow. why are you doing this to me why are wow. you why are you punishing me why can't i just stop yeah you know yeah and so fast forward i really really battled i messed up in so many so many ways i messed up a lot of friendships um, I pushed away a lot of great people that tried to really support me, but people can only um, they can help only go you so, out far. so much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you also have the part that you need to play, mm -hmm. and I wasn't really making an effort to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, sometime last year, my friend Johnson uh, Omonije had invited me to come to church, and mm -hmm. that is Rock West. Um, this wasn't the first time, but I was pretty skeptical. Uh, mm. to this come. wasn't your first time at being Rock invited, West or being invited being to church? Being invited okay. to church. Um, I was very skeptical every time he'd invite me before because I'd also had prior, um, I ha I'd had a prior uh, experience that was just not the best. At church? in terms of a church community that turned out to be not what I thought. Mm. And so that had really broken my trust when it came to, you know, finding a good community, trusting people and believing that anybody who's been called to serve has good intentions. And so I had my own perception of mm. what church and people in church are all about. Mm. And so on this particular day, I accepted to come I told him, you know what, I'm going to come. I'd gotten, you know, to the edge. I was just on the edge. Um, I tried committing suicide so many times. I felt like I was nothing. And I remember when I came, first I had a, I had a sprained foot. So I could barely walk. And so, you know, I was very high on that day. And... You know, when Pastor Flavia made the altar call, I was a bit shy. Um, I didn't feel like I was worthy of, mm. you know, coming forward. I looked at everybody and like I mentioned to you earlier, everyone just seems so put together. Yeah. I'm looking at everyone, everyone seems put together. I'm just a wreck and all that. But I felt very, very inclined to step forward. And the lady that was next to me um, walked me to the front I gave my life to Christ mm. and I remember just telling God on this day, you know, take the wheel. I'm done trying. I've done everything I could. I've tried to manipulate my, my way through situations. I've tried to control everything. I'm unable to. I don't have any moves left anymore. Wow. So you do your thing. Because you are at the end of the road. I was completely at the end. And I thank God for my friend Johnson because I really am not sure what more I was capable of. Um, at that point, and that was the only person I felt I had uh, left at that point as a friend. And so when I when I made the altar call, did the altar call, um, give my life to Christ, church was done, and I left. And when I left, the first thing I did was go to Naivas, 
at the liquor shop and bought more liquor. Yeah. Because I was feeling sick and I just needed to drink more. Yeah. And so fast forward. And you forward, had just gotten saved. Yes. And you were drunk by the time you were getting saved. Yes. My goodness. I was very high when I, when I did the altar call. Mm. And when I left, I had to drink some more. And wow. so I remember just telling God, you know what, Jesus, um, you know why I'm doing this. Like, I, I can't function. I really just need to feel better. Mm. And so that happened. And a week later, I get a call from Elder Anne, whom I'd been introduced to. And she asked me to come to church and meet Pastor Flavia, who wanted to have a conversation with me. She'd been given a bit of my story, and so she wanted to get yeah. to know me more. Yeah. Um, I was like, sure. And so when I came, the first thing I did again was, you know, I drank that morning, as usual. Um, I needed to feel confident first to be able to even talk to her. I needed to feel better physically um, and just function. But because you're not, when you're drunk, you're not aware of how drunk you are. Mm -hmm. So your body just keeps showing you and making you feel like you need more and more and more. Yeah. By the time I came to church, Pasi, I was messed up. I was, was, that, was that, that was on a Sunday? Yes, the next Sunday. Okay. Yes, I was completely messed up. I could barely walk. By the time I got to the gate, I remember falling. And now this, uh, this uh, young man at the gate was like, are you okay? And I'm like, whoa, how are people going to view me? What are people going to say? This is crazy. So try and make a call and, and just let them know I'm out here because I can't come in. Um, I don't know what she's going to think, but hey, here I am. You asked for me. Yeah. This is this wow. is me. At least I'm And you had up. gotten saved a week prior to this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. And so I meet Pastor Flavia and Elder Anne who came to pick me. And of course they noticed how drunk I was. She put me in her car and off we go to her house. And so she tried to sober me up, but I was, I was too far gone. And so she put me to bed to sleep so that I could sleep it off and maybe wake up and have a conversation later. So I wake up in the middle of the night. At first I'm, I'm just shocked. Then I remember where I am and the first thing that came to my mind was, okay, I need more alcohol. That was always the first thing when I wake up. Now I'm not in my own space. I don't know where I am, but I need booze. And so I just go um, find her and ask her, Pasi, hi, um, I need to go and get more liquor. She was like, no, my dear, I don't think that's what you need. Come and sit down with me. And so she tells me, you know, I think you have a problem. You agree, right? And I was very honest and I told her, yes, I've known for a while I have a problem, but I just don't know what to do about it at this point. I've tried in my own strength, nothing is working. Mm. And at this point I've lost everything, so it doesn't even feel like there's anything left to more to live for. And she told me something really, really powerful that has stuck with me till today. She told me, Shiro, everything that you go through is God giving you the authority to speak in that facet of life. One day you'll be seated somewhere talking about your struggle and it's gonna be a survival guide for someone else. And wow. I, I just mm. looked at her and I was like, what is she talking about? Because that's mm. deep. But does she really understand how much of a mess I am? Wow. And so she asked me, can you be patient? Let's wait until the morning and go see a doctor, which is what I did, went back to sleep. I really suffered through that, the yeah. rest of the night. Yeah. You know, the fever, the sweats, shaking. Withdrawals. Withdrawals, they were just insane. Um, Mark you, at this point, I haven't really been sober, not even one day for the last few years every single day I'm drinking and so it's my body is just in shock and so the next morning this was um, on a Monday morning and this is June 19th uh, last year 2023 she takes me to meet this doctor a wonderful man called Mr. Paul uh, he owns the Genesis Sober Community a great rehabilitation center yeah. in Kiambu and he got to assess me. And the moment he met me, he could just see the problem. I had ordered for a passion juice I could barely hold. I was so scared to break the glass. I couldn't really take, 
anything, keep anything down. And um, he ended up just letting Pastor Flav know that I, I need to be an in-house patient. I need treatment, medical help mm. uh, to be able to detox. Um, and once we can stabilize my body physically, um, and medically, then we can start dealing with, uh, you know, counseling therapy yeah. to get to the root of yeah, the, emotional side, the yeah. issue yeah. Yeah, and why I actually drink as much as I did. So you got into rehab? Yes. Did you do it willingly? Or did you just Absolutely. think, did you just think, I'm going to see a doctor and then the doctor is saying you've got to be admitted? Did you know this was rehab? Were you aware of it? Yes. So when, the, when I met the doctor, he explained everything to me. He yeah. told me, you know, I have a rehabilitation center. This is how it runs. This is the program mm. we offer. This, he, he broke down for me what exactly happens, having to restructure my body um, physically, uh, restructuring mentally, and um, just generally the, the way it all works. Mm -hmm. And he was able to explain to me why I was unable to stop drinking. He broke down for me, you know, how the genetic predisposition works, why some people can be social drinkers and others not at all, mm -hmm. uh, like myself. And at this point, I was so desperate to just get clean, to just stop that I don't even care if I was going to be sent to Alaska. I was ready and willing wow. to wow. just do anything. Yeah. Because I felt that mm. in the end, in the end of it all, at the end of it all, it doesn't matter what I ever achieve in life, who I have, who I don't have. If I'm not sober, then nothing else wow. can happen. Wow. And me being in that state just meant that everything else felt dead. And that was just me battling my demons and mm. and I was losing in every other way because this was the one thing that was, you mm. know, holding mm. me by the neck. Mm. And I was very willing and ready and it's it was the best thing I'd heard. And you know, mm. this happened shortly after my birthday, so I felt like this was the best way to just start, you know, a new chapter of my mm. life. Mm. Yes. Wow. Shiro, you go through rehab, how long were you there? I was there for almost four months. Almost four months? Yes. How hard was it? How tough was it? I know I keep hearing people who go into rehab, the whole, um, the withdrawals are something else. Did you, did you go through any of this? Yes. Is yes. it tough? It's tough. But you were, your, your, your will was so strong, you wanted to go through it. Yes. It was really tough and I'll really insist on the physical withdrawals. Don't, do not let anybody kid you. They are painful. They are brutal. I was literally sick the first, for the, uh, the first one week being mm. there mm. that I ended up having, uh, I ended up being taken to hospital. So I had to be taken out of rehab and taken to hospital. That's how tough for, they were. That's how bad it was, how bad it got. But you know, it had to get worse so that it could get better. Yeah. You know, yeah. because the alcohol getting out of your system yeah. and you know, you just recalibrating, you know, it's not the easiest thing. Yeah. But my will was much stronger. I knew that this is what I wanted. I didn't have any second guessing at all. I was like, I'd be on my bed, I'm throwing up. I'm just, you know, going through the motions, the fever, feeling sick, I can't sleep. I'm just mentally messed up. And you know, you have those moments where you're like, did I make a mistake? Maybe I just needed one last drink. Mm -hmm. But I kick that thought out of my mind and I'm like, no, this is for the bigger, bigger picture. Wow. And I'm gonna fight through this because wow. I'm a fighter. Yes, and, and my will was, was just that strong. And I thank God because I also feel like having given my life to Christ, I opened also a certain level. I, 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 I opened up myself mm. to just allowing the Holy Spirit to work. Mm. You know, just do the work for me and mm. carry me through. Mm. Because addiction and alcoholism is not just a um, physical battle. Yeah. This is also a spiritual, spiritual battle. Yeah. And as much as we have so many people who come from different faiths mm. um, that are part of the program, whatever higher power it is that each person believes in, yes. you have to really submit yeah. because you cannot fully do it wow. in your own strength.
Yeah. And I remember very well that we were taught that anytime you cleanse yourself from something and you, you feel like you're done with that chapter of your life, you have to be very cognizant of the fact that if you leave any opening for the enemy to attack, he will attack seven times more. Yeah, it will yes. come back greater in greater yes. time. You mentioned before we started this interview that when, and especially ladies, when they go through alcoholism and have to go into rehab, there's a particular stigma that comes with it. Yes. Do you want to speak about that for a minute? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really insane because I would be drinking out here with so many men and of course different women, but you'd find that if probably I can down a whole bottle, a 1.2 bottle of vodka, and a man does the same thing, um, I'm looked at as somebody who has a problem. For the guy, he's a hero, but for me, I'm pretty messed up. Like mm -hmm. for a woman, how can you drink like that? And my, just the way it worked for me is that I would out drink so many people that sometimes even the people you're drinking with run away from you because mm. they're like, that one is just a distillery. I was called so many names, wow. you know, and wow. people just looking down on me like, no, 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 that one is a walking bar, you know, and even when I got into rehab, one thing that stood out for me is that we were only three females in between close to 30 men. Wow. Yes, I found two ladies and after you know about a month a month and a half they left and so i was the only female for the rest of my stay and having you know done a bit of research on it it's that a lot of women feel ashamed to come forward and talk about them having yeah. these problems yeah. and i get why because for a long time i also hid it yeah. because even just being in a bar drinking or or being out there drinking, it, it seems to be more of a guy thing. Mm. And so for women, you're supposed to be put together, supposed to be a natural, you're supposed to be a homemaker, you know? And so people will look at you as somebody who can't even be wife material mm. or anybody that you'd be proud to take home. Yeah. And so I was always the, the, the chick that you want to hang out with. Yeah, but you don't want to party with. You don't want to introduce her to your mom. You know, yeah. yes. She wrote, you're so eloquent you i mean no one would ever imagine that you were going through this thank you and there are many people out there who are probably struggling with the same thing you're struggling with or were struggling with and they're wondering is there a way out of this is there hope is there life after this problem um i want you to look into that camera there's a lady somewhere who's saying shiro you're, you've just described my story how can i come out of this and one day sit on a bench like that and give my story. Why don't you speak to her? Absolutely, thank you so much. I really, really hope this blesses you. Um, I thank God for the far that he's brought me, for preserving me, and he can do the same for you. There is hope at the end of the road. Um, if you're struggling with addiction, whether alcoholism or any substance abuse, just know that you can always reach out to anybody that is willing to connect you with somebody either in a facility, in your church community, the first thing you need to do, to do is just be very honest and open about your problem. We can only get the help by helping ourselves and that begins by just being open and honest. There are many programs out here, AA um, and NA programs that help us deal with addiction. There's so many um, AA communities that are willing to just listen whether you're going through financial issues, physical issues, social, emotional, family, it doesn't matter. And there is treatment at the end of the day, but also forget, don't forget that God is bigger than whatever you're going through. Amen. Wow. How long has it been? I've been seven months clean now. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so wow. much. So what are you doing right now? So right now, I'm still a creative just like I've always been, yes. uh, making music, still singing, performing here and there, um, co-writing for artists. Um, I've been delving a bit more into synchronization, which is creating music for films. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to get into the media space, hoping maybe to get into radio or TV, well but done. whatever God yeah. decides to unfold for yeah. me, I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready. I remember the first time we spoke, I told you, you just sound like a media personality. May Thank God you. open that door for you. Amen. In Jesus' name.
Uh, Shiro, I want to ask one more question before we, we, we wind down. Yeah. How's your relationship with mom now? Wow, uh, that's a very good question. I would say that we're trying to be friends. We're trying to be friends. Let's not jump the gun and talk about <laughs> mother-daughter. She'll always be my mom. Yeah. I'll be her daughter. That doesn't yeah. change. Yeah. I know a parent's love will always be there, irregardless. And also my love for my mother. But because we didn't really know each other and we'd never really taken time to know each other, we've been delving into a space where we, we're, we're spending time with each other, getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. She's been very supportive of my uh, recovery, um, championing me to keep staying clean, staying sober. And one of the craziest things that I keep saying is that the one thing that tore us apart is the same thing that brought us together. I had to be humbled through this alcoholism experience for me to actually get off my high horse and understand what she was going through. I used to bash her so much and, and blame her for everything and why was she drinking, why wasn't she, um, why wasn't she as normal as other parents until I became an alcoholic myself and voila. I, I, I had a realization, oh, wow. so this is how difficult wow. it was for her. Yeah. And even for me, I'm healing because um, I realized that I put her down so much and it probably broke her a lot, you know, it coming from your own child, feeling as if I never really understood her. And I thank God that this has happened so that one day when I have my own daughter or my yeah. own son, yeah. I'm able to understand and know how to deal with them and how to educate them on this before, you know, they find themselves on the same path. As have me. you forgiven mom? I have. I have. I would say I have. I'm in a good place. I don't have any resentment. And to be honest, the, this whole recovery journey has been the biggest reason why I've, I've gotten to a place where I'm like, now I understand what you were going through and it's okay. I wish I'd known what I know now. I would have actually reached out earlier and I would have helped you out. But God works in mysterious ways and everything takes its time for a reason. Wow, yeah. well put, well said. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from Shiro Ogola. My goodness, her story has been rich. I don't know about you, but I have been enriched by this story. Uh, of one who is able to go through all these different, I mean, the number of homes she's lived in, the things she's gone through, the trials, the tribulations, the challenges. And for her to be able to be here today and say, but God was good, is only a miracle. She's a walking miracle. I cannot wait to see what God does in her life. I can't wait to see what her next phase will look like. If you're out there struggling with one thing or the other, I want you to know, listen to her story again, and then believe that there's something better, something greater that is coming to you. Until next time, thank you for joining us today. This has been, I've been meaning to ask. Thank you, Shiro, for joining us. Thank you so us. much. Asante sana. Asante sana.